Hello, everyone, and welcome to this stream. Uh, so if you are new to the channel, my name is Sayam Pathak, and I'm a CNCF ambassador working as director of technical evangelism at CEO and uh, very excited to start this particular session and this particular series, uh, to be honest. Uh, so basically, we are doing a, a rancher to say a live stream series of the open source products that um, they are working super hard on, which makes very much sense to be discussed in the cloud native community with respect to Kubernetes. And uh, uh, they are, I mean, amazing products that, that the team is working on. And I am super excited to show you um, uh, some of these starting today with Cube Warden, uh, which is a kind of policy engine uh, for writing uh, the policies uh, and policy as code, basically. So uh, we'll be talking all about the policy engine and how it works, how what is Cube Warden, how it works, why it is there in first place and how actually you can use it, some of its features. Uh, the demo is obviously there and how you will be able to contribute back and you know uh, join some of the meetings, Slack and all that stuff. And yes, there is a swag giveaway as well. So I'm just posting a link in these this in the uh, live chat. So please enter the form to uh, enter in the swag giveaway. Uh, so that's that's uh, so we'll be doing uh, five of the swag giveaways uh, just as as usual. Yeah, obviously when again we'll have more, we'll do more. But for now we'll do five swag giveaways and. Uh, uh, really excited to have uh, Flavio with us, uh, who is a distinguished engineer at SUSE uh, and working on uh, Linux, containers, Kubernetes, and exploring new con uh, technologies, contributing to open source. Uh, a great person uh, and, uh, uh, you know, really excited to have uh, him on the stream. Uh, so welcome, Flavio, and uh, thank you for giving time and, uh, you know, uh, telling us about uh, Cube Bottom. I mean, you will be telling us about Cube Bottom, but uh, uh, pre-thanks kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for, for inviting me, for, for organizing all of that. It's uh, really, really cool and nice. Thanks a lot. Awesome. So yeah, uh, if you are new to the channel, definitely please subscribe to it because it motivates me to do more, push myself in my free time to bring you the cloud native uh, uh, technologies which are brand new in the ecosystem and how we can be as a community can drive that, accelerate that in the right direction. So uh, I think that is very important. And we obviously talk about that in the end. So make sure you subscribe that if you're watching on YouTube and if you're watching on Twitch, then uh, probably press that follow button. And uh, without further ado, uh, I think we are already two minutes in and um, we can, I think we can start. So I'll remove that subscribe banner and uh, probably we can uh, start with policies. So why basically we can start with the first initial uh, setting the stage why the Kubernetes policies itself exist and why they it, it what importance does uh, Kubernetes policy have? Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, so I have some slides just to give you a brief overview about uh, Kubernetes, what it does, why we created that, how it differentiates from other solutions, and then, as mentioned, I have a short demo. So um, first of all, for the ones who are not uh, really familiar with this concept, uh, Kubernetes policies are, are one of the tools, one of the many tools that uh, people use to, to secure their Kubernetes clusters. Uh, there are many ways to do that. Security is a, is a complex topic. And policies, they, they cover a really specific area, a really specific uh, case. So they are there to evaluate the, the objects that are about to be created inside of a cluster or to evaluate the requests about uh, removal of, of resources that are already inside of a Kubernetes cluster or requests about changes to something that already exists inside of a Kubernetes cluster. To make it uh, more specific, um, you have a user who, for example, uh, creates a wants to create a, a pod inside of your cluster. And as soon as he, he sends the request to the Kubernetes API server, um, one policy could look into this um, pod creation request and, uh, and then based on some um, internal logic, decide whether this uh, request has to be accepted and hence the pod is going to be uh, scheduled somewhere in the cluster. Or if the pod is not uh, respecting some, some constraints, the, the request can be rejected, which means that the user will never be able to, to schedule this pod inside of the cluster. Or there are some other cases which are called mutations where uh, the pod might be accepted into the cluster, but with some 
some modification to what the user originally requested. For example, maybe the user forgot to, to specify some labels and there are policies in the company to enforce certain labels to always be there. So this is, uh, this is what um, Kubernetes policies do. And today we are here to talk about policies code, which means um, writing uh, in, inside of uh, inside some, some, some files, some, some logic that uh, then evaluates all these requests. So um, I've seen that in the past, um, this, uh, this channel already covered uh, this topic. So I will, I will go straight uh, to the point. So uh, why did you have uh, to create a new uh, policy engine? I mean, there are already other policy engines for Kubernetes that are uh, even inside of CNCF at different graduation levels like Open Policy Agent uh, uh, and Kyverno. So why did you create something new? Uh, well, we, um, we thought carefully about about that because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel uh, so first of all we, we we went out and we 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 got our hands dirty we spoke with uh with uh, several people and uh, it turned out that um uh, writing policies as code is not so easy at least this is what we and other people think about so uh you have to basically change the way you you think you reason when it comes to to writing those policies you have to learn uh new languages that are not really programming languages they are uh, query languages and these based on your on your personal skills can be simple or can be harder but what we we, we figured out at is that uh a lot of people don't feel really productive when it comes to, to writing these policies because they, they have really to, to switch context, to, to switch the way they think about how to, to solve certain, uh, let's say, simple, even simple uh, uh, checks, you know. And, um, and what is, uh, as a side effect of that, um, the, the people uh, inside, of a, inside of a company, inside of a team that can uh, write policies are, are not many. If you're lucky, you might have one or two people inside of a team that can write uh, policies. And, uh, and then all the work of writing policies goes through these people. And the policy as code, at least the way I see that, means that you have also to review those policies and you have to maintain those policies over the time. And if you don't have many people that can you know review and maintain them then it's uh you have bottlenecks and uh, and you you are really prone to to introduce regression and issues so what we want to do is to simplify the process of of creating policy as code and while we are at that we also want to provide um a different take on how policies are distributed. And this is something that is going to affect more, not just the, the policy authors, because that has an impact on them in a positive way, we think, but is also going to affect the other users of the story. Because here, I think we have two personas. You have the people that are writing the policies, the policy authors, and then you have the people who are consuming the policies, the Kubernetes administrators. And for, for the second group, what they want is to have uh, a way that they already know, a really uh, uh, consolidated way to, to distribute the policies, to, uh, to, to, to ship them across many clusters. And, and, and this is why, basically, we, we started Cube Warden, because we, we thought that we could provide a better answer to these two questions. So the, the, que the next thing is, is how do we differentiate, you know? Uh, how, how, does, how can you accomplish that? So we, um, we take really a, a different uh, take on, on, the, on the process of writing and distributing policies. So first of all, our policies are WebAssembly modules. And I'm going to dig more into that next because I assume that uh, not many of you know what WebAssembly is. And the next thing is uh, these WebAssembly modules, which you can see as, as binary artifacts, they are distributed using a, a really well-known way to distribute binaries, which are container registries. So all your policies are stored inside of container registries and then are pulled and pushed into container registries. And these container registries can be secured in the very same way that you're already using. So it's the same mechanism to distribute your container images and, and you are going to leverage that uh, also to distribute your policies. So I mentioned WebAssembly, so what it is. So 
WebAssembly is, is, a, is a technology that is relatively new. It's something that was uh, born uh, for the browser, for the web. It, is, uh, uh, it was a way uh, to, to extend the browser, to bring extra capabilities in it. Uh, think about, I'm a web developer. I have some, some code, some routine that uh, needs to run on, on the client side and needs to do some, uh, some computation. And doing that in pure JavaScript is not going to be fast enough. So WebAssembly is the solution to that because WebAssembly allows you to take uh, a program written in any programming language and then take this program and build that and build that not into a library for your operating system or an executable for your operating system, but instead it becomes uh, this binary artifact called WebAssembly module. So WebAssembly is a compilation target. All right. When building your uh, program, you don't end up having a .exe file. You end up having a .wasm file, and then you take this file and you deploy that. You deploy that in the browser, or uh, more recently, uh, it's WebAssembly is something that is running also outside of the browser. The reason for that is because uh, many people realize that WebAssembly provides a lot of uh, really, really interesting features and advantages. And so having that, let's say, confined only to the browser would be you know, a waste of, of talent. So uh, WebAssembly can be run not just inside of the browser nowadays, but also outside of it. And the, the, the interesting aspect is that you take this uh, WebAssembly module that you built on your laptop, and then you can run that inside of the browser, inside of uh, what we call a WASM runtime. And you don't bother, as a developer, you don't bother to, to build this uh, binary for Linux and Linux on Intel or for macOS on Intel or macOS on Apple Silicon. You don't care. The, the, the WebAssembly binary format is portable, which, uh, which means literally build once and run everywhere. And I know that, you know, that was also the, the slogan of, of Java, but, uh, and it didn't really turn out uh, that way, but this time is, is really different. And what is really exciting to summarize that is that uh, as, a, as a policy author, for example, I can write the policy using one of his languages. I build that on my laptop, which is running on, on Apple Silicon. And then I, I run the very same policy, the very same binary file inside of a Windows host on, uh, on Intel or instead of a Linux host on, on ARM. And I don't have to, to get bruises by uh, recompiling everything. I don't know how many of you got bruises by, by building multi-arc container images. So this is not going to happen in this case. So to summarize, what are the benefits of WebAssembly? The first one is the, the freedom of choice. You can take a, a programming language of your choice and there are a lot of programming languages that are already supporting WebAssembly and more are coming because it's a, it's a huge trend. You take this programming language of your choice and you build a WebAssembly module. And then thanks to the second, uh, second benefit, you can run it everywhere. You don't have to recompile that for different operating systems, for different architectures. It's just, uh, as I said before, build once run everywhere. And last but not least, there is a security aspect into all of that. So if we go back to what I said, WebAssembly was uh, created for, for the browser, for the web. And as you can imagine, no, the web is a, is a can be a dangerous place, and so you can imagine a browser downloading some some binaries and then running that locally to to do some computation. So this is something that can end up running uh, untrusted code, is running untrusted code, and can be running malicious code. So there have been a lot of uh, thinking and reasoning into the design of WebAssembly to make it secure to ensure that. Uh, there is no way for, uh, or it's really hard for, for a WebAssembly guest to escape and, uh, and have access to the host system or interfere with, uh, with the other WebAssembly modules that are running. And so KubeWarden, by using WebAssembly's technology behind, is inheriting all these advantages. And when you're running our policies, these policies are isolated from each other and from the host we are running inside of a secure sandbox. And this is <clears throat> a pretty nice uh, set of features that we get for free by using WebAssembly. 
So what can you do with uh, with Kubewarden? Sorry, give me a sec. Yeah, so uh, meanwhile, Flavius uh, printing yeah. Warden. So what we'll do is um, uh, basically, till now you have, you must have uh, an idea like why Kubernetes policies are important for catering specific <clears throat> use cases. Like you, uh, you <clears throat> want a specific labels on some uh, some applications that you forgot, and you want to mutate things. You want to validate some of the things. So all the validation, mutation, and all those things are taken care of by uh, the policy. And now there are specific tools. You can watch the streams that Saloni has just posted the link in the chat for Kiverno and OPA. Now OPA with OPA, obviously you need to learn a language called Rego, which is not actually a programming language as Flavio mentioned, uh, but it is it is kind of a, a language that only uh, caters a specific use case for uh, writing policies. Uh, so yes, there is additional learning curve for that. And if you talk about, uh, again, um, uh, projects like Keverno, uh, it is very easy to use, uh, very easy to get started because it is kind of Kubernetes native way. But again, it uh, does not uh, cater the complex use cases and the complex validation and mutation that you would want, uh, you know, that you can code. So that's where you have uh, KubeWarden and KubeWarden is kind of uh, uh, using WebAssembly, Wasm, uh, and which was very good explained by Flavio. Uh, so you have, you can basically write, you can use your existing knowledge of programming languages and you can write uh, the the policies using those programming languages and use them. so that that uh, reduces the learning curve uh, that increases the flexibility uh, to write complex uh, policies using your favorite programming language, with, whether it's uh, Rust yeah. or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, any of those JavaScript or Java, whatever was there in the slide in any of them. And they, they get that get converted to the Wasm modules and that can, it gets, uh, you know, uh, that actually runs. Uh, so you don't have to care about the systems, the Mac OS, Linux, and, you know, uh, all those uh, compilations. So uh, that's where we are. And uh, that's where Cube Warden was on and uh, uh, why we have actually the cube water. So now we'll move on to like what all things that can be done with cube water. You brought up some interesting points. Uh, I want to, I, I would go back to 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 them for a second. <laughs> um, so you are writing the policies using your favorite programming language using your known tools and you can also while doing that you can also tap into the system of uh, into the ecosystem of that language you can reuse libraries that are already there for this language you can write a unit test for your policy using the, the the usual libraries and 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 patterns that you use for writing policies of your your apps and and then you can also reuse uh, uh, build pipelines test pipelines in order to produce the policies and to test them it's really it's really code okay it's it's real code so i will show you something later um and there was a question, is WebAssembly something that is built using Rust? Um, uh, no, um, there are a lot there. Rust is a first class, uh, Rust handles WebAssembly as a first class citizen, but there are many other programming languages that are can be built uh, with WebAssembly as a target. And I will talk about that pretty soon. So what can you do uh, with, uh, with KubeWarden in terms of what kind of policies can you write? Uh, you can write policies that validate uh, some input data. So pod creation is this pod creation uh, uh, reflecting uh, some some policies we have. Like, uh, does it have this label? Yes, no. If it doesn't, we just reject that. This is validation. Mutation. I will show you an example live of mutation, which basically is something that uh, takes a, a, a request and accepts, rejects it, or eventually accept a modified version of the initial object. I will show you an example. And when doing this kind of evaluation, you can do this evaluation of the policies in two modes. The first mode is in, let's say, isolation mode. So the policy receives some input data, which is <clears throat> the operation, the action that is about to happen. <clears throat> If any can evaluate based on that data, like uh, what is the name of the, of the pod, what are the specification of it, what is the namespace where it's going to be created. But there are other cases where you want to have some extra information, like for example, the typical example of that is validating ingress objects. Uh, when validating an ingress object, you probably also want to know what are the other ingress objects that are already defined inside of the cluster in order to have a policy that makes sure that if you accept the creation of a new ingress object, there is not going to be a conflict with the other ones that are already 
over there. And this is what we call context-aware policies. So both validation and mutation policies, by default, they work in isolation mode. But if you want, you can bring some extra data into, into the at evaluation time by making them context-aware. And this is a feature that we have, which is currently in alpha state, and we plan to, to graduate it to, to production ready uh, pretty soon. So uh, how can you write these policies? So in terms of programming languages, right now we have SDKs uh, for, for Rust, for Go, for Swift, and for assembly script, where assembly script, for the ones who don't know it, is a subset of TypeScript built ex explicitly for WebAssembly. So it's just a JavaScript, let's say. Uh, it's a type JavaScript. Uh, there are many other languages that can, can be built into, into WebAssembly. Um, the fact that do not show up on this slide doesn't mean that they can't work with uh, keyboard. And on the contrary, so if you have some language that you want to, to use to, to, to write policies please reach out to us and we can help you to 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 get uh, to get that done we're really interested in in all of that it's really an exciting time for for web assembly and a lot of languages are just jumping on this uh, on this wagon um <clears throat> Now let's talk about how everything fits together, fits with Kubernetes. So uh, Kubewarden is, is doing policy evaluation just for Kubernetes so far. Uh, the way we integrate with, with Kubernetes is by, first of all, defining a, a Kubernetes uh, custom resource, which is called cluster admission policy, which is how you define a policy that has to be enforced inside of your cluster. I will show you how it looks like pretty soon. Then we have a controller, which is a, a deployment visit that is running inside of your cluster and is monitoring actions done against this uh, custom resource. And every time you create a new one, you modify an existing one, or you delete one, then this one trans uh, this controller translate all this action into configuration changes for the policy server. And policy server. Is, uh, is another deployment inside of a cluster. And this is where policies are actually evaluated. This is a component that is uh, downloading the policies and then is uh, it has inside of it a WebAssembly um, uh, evaluator. Uh, runtime, sorry, uh, WebAssembly runtime, and it uses that to evaluate the, the incoming request uh, coming from the API server. So this is basically a web application that is receiving uh, all the different JSON blobs produced by, by the Kubernetes API server whenever a user is trying to do something inside of a cluster. It, uh, it receives uh, the request, it uh, takes the right policy, it evaluates the, the JSON with, uh, with the business logic that is inside of this policy, and then it produces a result, which can be accept, reject, or accept with a mutation. Uh, the way to deploy this stack into your cluster is by using a Helm chart. This is a screenshot from Artifact Hub. Uh, we'll give you links to, to, to this uh, chart. And as you can see here, it's really straightforward. The way to install everything is really straightforward. It's just an Helm install. Uh, the default values are, are already fine enough. So once you do that, you get everything uh, done, com configured inside of your cluster. And last but not least, we have this website, which is called Policy Hub. And this is a community place to, to share exchange policies. So the keyboard and policies can be found inside of this website. And if you have uh, policies that you want to, to, to show, feel free to reach out to us and we, we can uh, add them over there. Uh, well, actually adding policies to this website is just one pull request away from you. Um, and instead that, I would go into, into the demo. Uh, cool. <clears throat> so if I understand correctly, um, we have uh, the, the architecture wise, how, how Warden is working. Uh, so we have the custom resource, uh, the Warden controller, and the policy server. So we first uh, uh, do the uh, cluster admission policy, the custom resource, and then we have uh, the policy as a deployment, policy server as a deployment. Uh, which holds all the policies and checks uh, and has the uh, WebAssembly runtimes and evaluates against the uh, JSON that is, uh, you know, uh, getting getting to it. And and then we have the Q1 controller that is, you know, uh, every time we have a new, uh, the cluster, cluster admission control, policy, yep. cluster, cluster admission policy, it uh, reconfigures the uh, the policies in the uh, policy server. 
So I think that's yep. that's how right that that the overall architecture you got looks it. like. Yes, yes, you got it. Awesome. And so you can have as many instances of policy server as you want in case you want to scale. And yep. So Cube Warden is compatible with Cubeword or it'll uh, only it or only it will generate with K8. So so I think I can take that like uh, Cubeword basically is uh, Cubeword again is 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 something that uh, uh, you know uh, lets you uh, to manage virtual machines with uh, Kubernetes with the power of Kubernetes. Uh, so this particular um, uh, what you call cube warden will be deployed as a helm chart uh, you can use uh, the deployment as a helm chart helm deploy which is uh, there on the artifact hub uh, so that's that's the link I already posted in the chat uh, so you can deploy that and after that you can use the existing policies from the hub dot uh, dot you can also write your own policies which are not there and contribute back so that other people from the community can use those so i think that's that's pretty a uh, new thing which which is not there so basically uh, uh, you as a community person uh, can write a very good policy that can be used that you think can be used across you know multiple projects multiple organizations uh, so you can definitely uh, create a policy on the po and uh, put that on policy hub so that other folks can also um, utilize the uh, that the power of the policy that you have written yeah, maybe the confusion came from uh, me saying that uh, we have a VM for for uh, for WebAssembly, but you ah. can imagine that as a, as a, it's a language VM. It's not a virtual machine, all right? Yeah, thanks for clarifying. So I think yep. now uh, at this point we have enough knowledge on Kubernetes policies, how they work, what is Cube Warden, what does it offer, the validation mutation, and uh, the uh, even the bringing the context. Uh, so uh, I think we have the we have overall um, uh, knowledge of how it works, how it can be deployed, what are the policies, and uh, the policy server controller and the CR custom resource. So I think it's it's uh, uh, you know better that we see it in action. Yeah, sure, sure. Let's go. Um, so I will um, talk today uh, I, as a now I'm I will wear the, the hat of a Kubernetes administrator. And um, as you probably know, Kubernetes pod security policies are going to be deprecated, already deprecated, and are going to be dropped pretty soon from Kubernetes. And uh, policy engines are a way to bring back uh, these pod security policies into, into Kubernetes. I know that there are other uh, initiatives on going upstream to, to come up with better replacement of PSPs, but in the meantime, policy engine can, 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 can cover you. So um, I want to uh, to to have a policy in place that is uh, inspecting pod creation and making sure that uh, users do not create uh, containers with uh, with certain capabilities. So capabilities are basically features uh, that uh, are knobs that you can use to to allow containers to perform certain operations. So if you want to have uh, <clears throat> a, pro a process that uh, binds to, to a port below number 80, uh, you have to grant him a certain privilege unless the user starting that is, is, a, is, a, is a root. So capabilities can be, can be abused by people to, to escape from containers. So it's a good practice to just uh, limit what, uh, what, uh, what users can, can specify when when uh, when creating uh, pods, and there was a PSP. There is a PSP that is uh, that is doing exactly that, uh, like an official Kubernetes PSP. So um, I want to find uh, a PSP that does the very uh, sorry a cube warden policy that does the very same thing. So here I go to Policy Hub and I can search for like privileged, and I can see that I have a policy that is. Uh, affecting privileged containers. I have another one that is affecting uh, another security context option of pods, which is allow privilege escalation. So I can <clears throat> I can search for capabilities and uh, well, I, I get exactly what I'm looking for. So now I can go to the homepage of this uh, policy and you can see here that this is a GitHub project. Uh, it has uh, instructions on how to use the policy. It has some examples and it has the source code of the policy. Now, unless someone asks for it, uh, I can also dig into the, the source code, but uh, it's just a, 
regular programming language. Uh, this policy happens to be written in Rust. It's an example. We have others written in the, the programming languages that I mentioned before. What I want to stress out is that uh, you can really treat policies as code. So I'm using GitHub Actions over there to, uh, to do continuous integration, running uh, tests, Against uh, against the policy, uh, running uh, linters, uh, running a test suite, and then when I I'm ready to to do to, to release a new version as a policy offer, I just uh, release it, and then I have a pipeline over there that is taking care of uh, of building the artifact, testing it, and then publishing that, and it publishes that into a container registry which uh, in this case is, uh, is the GitHub Container Registry. And here you can see uh, all the versions that have been pushed. GitHub Container Registry, assume that this is a Docker image. It is not. It's a, it's a WebAssembly policy. So we are uh, using a well-known and established method to, to, to share uh, artifacts also for our policies. So, um, as, a, um, as an operator, I found this policy. Now I want to try it out. So I just copy the link to the policy and I, I go down there on, on, my, on, my, on my system. And uh, there is a really simple and easy way to try it out policies without having to, to have a Kubernetes cluster up and running. So we have a common line tool called KWCTL. Uh, I will give to you a link to that I forgot earlier earlier to share the link. So with KWCTL, uh, sorry can, to interrupt, uh, yeah. Flavio. Can you yeah. increase the font size a bit, little? Is it good? One, one more big would be better. Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank All you. Right. So with KWCTL, uh, I have a CLI tool that is uh, mimicking uh, the, the, the CLI uh, user experience of Docker. So I can do a pool of uh, of my policy. I'm pulling that from a registry. I could be pulling it from uh, an HTTP, HTTPS website. Now I have downloaded it. And list all the policies I have on my on my system right now. I just have this one, all right. And I can see some information about uh, this policy. This policy is a mutating one. It's not context aware. This is the checksum I can use to pull the policy in the same way I, I, I could pull a Docker image. This is the size of the policy. The size of the policy changes a lot depending on the programming language that was used to build WebAssembly. Um, so it can be big for Swift. Swift policies are pretty big. They are working to optimize that. But yeah, I have a policy over there. Now, I want to, to know more about how to use that policy. Of course, I could go back to the website to look at that, but there is another thing. Uh, the, uh, all the policies have metadata embedded into that, and this metadata gives in information about you know uh, the name of the policy, a short description with the author, the URL, the licensing, if it's mutating, context aware, and then it provides some information about what kind of uh, resources this policy is tracking. So this policy is tracking pods and is taking care of, uh, of creation requests. And this is interesting because, I mean, this policy could also work with uh, updates of, of policies, but uh, Kubernetes doesn't allow you to change the container capabilities of, of something that already exists. So the policy author knows about that and, and, and put that in place inside of the metadata of the policy so that uh, the end user of it doesn't have to think about that. Uh, it could also add updates, but then uh, the policy would be called uh, for, for operations that are not really relevant that are and, and, hand in, hand, and, and then introduce some delays and such. However, I also have a description over there, which explains to me how to use the policy. So the policies, uh, depending on how the alpha or structure of the policy, uh, can be tuned at runtime. So they take some configuration values that can influence how the policy are going to, to behave. And so in this case, we have uh, uh, the policy, the settings are, are a, a dictionary, are a map with some keys. The first one is allowed capabilities. So let's try to play around with the policy. So we're going to run the policy locally. We are going to run the policy with some settings that we, in this case, are going to specify from the CLI so that we can quickly iterate over those. So we're going to say that we are going to allow as capabilities, we're going to allow the chown capability. 
is one of the many capabilities and Kubernetes documentation has, you know, covers all of them. We're going to uh, use these uh, settings when running the policies. We have to provide something to validate. So here, before uh, ahead of time, I, I recorded an example of, uh, of, a, of a JSON request. So this is a JSON request uh, trimmed down to make it uh, shorter about uh, the creation of, uh, of the pod, which has two containers inside of it. One container is called Nginx, and it has a security context, which is adding some capabilities. And it's adding the GH own capability. The other one, the other container in the same pod is, uh, is MariaDB, and it doesn't add anything in terms of capabilities. So now we are going to, um, to use this, in this, this JSON file as input, and we're going to run this policy to evaluate that. So we get a result out of it. The result is uh, is that these requests with the UID that was uh, inside of the incoming request is uh, is accepted. No, it's not accepted. It's not allowed because um, this policy is this, there is a container that is using the GH own um, capability, and we do not allow that. Okay, and. And this is a mistake on my side, I think, because it was supposed to be allowed. Let me let me see. So it's using GH own as add. Okay. And here we are doing GH own has to be added. But this is still rejecting that. That's the, the fun of doing things live. I tried that before. And just work it. It's missing something. I see someone writing that. It's miss ah oh, cap allowed capabilities. Uh, I made a typo somewhere. I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. I think that's the fun of live demo, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now this, it, I, I just pulled up from, from my bash history with something that was working. <laughs> okay, so um, it, was a, it was a mistake on me when specifying the JSON. So um, as you can see here, I, I further iterated, all right? So here the settings are are about allowing the GH own capability, but also requiring a capability to be dropped. So I said in the beginning uh, that this is something, this policy is a mutating policy, which means that it can accept uh, an incoming request, but do some modification to that. So what we get here in this case is, um, is a policy that is uh, accepting the incoming request, but it also has some extra information. So it uh, this is a mutation uh, uh, policy in action. So it's also providing a patch to the original request. The way Kubernetes works is that the patch is a is a base sixty four encoded string, which inside of it contains uh, a JSON patch. Now, if we want to decode it, what we can do here is I'm piping the result into JQ. I'm extracting from this JSON object the value of the patch attribute, the patch key. And then I'm piping that into, into the base64 command. And then I'm printing it out uh, in a fancy way. So let me show you the output again. So here, the output uh, is basically what is going to be mutated into the policy compared to the beginning. So here, JSON patch says that we are going to do a NAD operation. So we are going to extend the original JSON document and we're going to write something inside of this path. So so we are going to add under spec here, containers, the first element of, of, a, of a box, of, of a list, sorry. We're going to 
patch with the capabilities attribute, uh, sorry, the security context of it. And under capabilities, we are going to add a new, a new, uh, a new attribute, which is um, which is add zero drop net admin. Sorry, it's this is the patching of uh, of this block. All right. And here instead, we see that uh, the JSON patch is patching the first element, so it's zero based. So this container is going to be patched, and we are going to patch uh, here spec container zero, the security context, the capabilities, and then it's going to introduce a new key called drop with value uh, net admin. So this policy is basically changing the incoming object so that it uh, it uh, it looks in a different way and i'm going to show that uh, better now so as a policy uh, user i played a bit with uh, kwctl and this is something that you can use to uh, to run also the policies uh, inside of your ci system so that you are kind of unit testing your policies over the time to make sure that everything is is working as expected now it is time for me to to deploy the policy to enforce that in production so as i said before we use uh, a custom resource to do that so the way that um, kwctl can help you is by using a generate command all right so with kwctl generate you can say generate a template of class or admission policy using this uh, this policy and it was a mistake it is manifest <laughs> sorry and this policy is not the one that i've downloaded because i pulled it back from uh, from the history so as you can see here i generated a, a yaml file with uh, with the different settings of a sorry with a, with a different information about it so it's a class or mission policy with a pre-generated name of this policy with uh, an empty settings right now and this policy is uh, is a mutating one and is going to uh, affect this kind of operation creation of pods all right so we played a bit with uh, with the settings of the policy before and i I stored these settings also inside of a text file. So now I'm going to, to do um, uh, to generate a new manifest again for the same policy, but with uh, settings from, uh, from from this file. Sorry. Raise the yeah. So here, as you can see, the, the, the output that is created is a bit different different because the settings are the ones that I, I used before when playing around along with, with the policy. So I created this, uh, this is the policy I created, call it demo. Now I have uh, a policy loaded, um, ready to be deployed inside of this Kubernetes cluster that I have. So I just do a kubectl apply of uh, demo policy. And then I can start watching uh, this, uh, this custom resource. And as you can see, the policy is not uh, active yet. Now the, the policy is active, which means that policy server has, has loaded it up and is ready to serve it. If I do kwctl get uh, mutating webhook configuration, you can see that I have, a, uh, I, have, I have an entry. This entry was created automatically by our controller when reconciling the resource. And now let's try to, to deploy something. So here, we have um, a pod, which is not valid because it's trying to add the audit right a capability. And we do not allow that with our policy. So let's create that. And as you can see, the creation is rejected. And we get back from Kubernetes the, the message coming from our policy. All right, so the policy is working. Now let's try to, let, let me show you uh, 
how the mutation happens. So we are going to create this uh, this pod, which has the nginx with uh, with the capability to to ch own edit, and it has. Uh, the, the database one that has no capability, no, nothing specified. And again, our policy is allowing the CHO capability, but is requiring to drop a, a certain capability. So let's apply that. It's created. At the pod, we have to look into the YAML um, of the pod called demo, and then we can pipe that into, into that. So this is the pod that is being created. And it has some security contexts. So this is the Nginx container. As you as you remember, initially it had just uh, add chhone. Our policy uh, also extended the definition so that the net admin capability is dropped. And here we have the Alpine container, which is faking a database. <laughs> and um, this one has, uh, didn't have a security context at all in the beginning. Now it has a security context, and this security context is, is dropping uh, some capabilities. So as you can see, uh, our policy, we, we found a policy, we downloaded that, we played a bit around with it, with many mistakes on my side, I'm sorry, with many typos, but uh, we tried out locally and the policy was working. And then we generated uh, a manifest file starting from the settings that we used while iterating over the policy. And then we deployed that and uh, the policy is up there and uh, is working as expected. So this is basically a quick tour of what we have. But before before going back to, to other topics, I wanted to give you a, a really sneak peek of something that is uh, completely new. We haven't spoken about that. This is an exclusive for you, actually. So um, as you know, there are other uh, policy engines out there. I mentioned that before. And the, 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 um, one of the, the, the most famous one is, is Open Policy Agent. And a lot of people have already invested time into writing uh, Open Policy Agent or Gatekeeper policies. And uh, maybe they are afraid to, to, to move to something else because they would end up losing all this, uh, all this uh, work that they have done in the past. So um, we are thinking about a way to basically allow Kubewarden to run uh, open policy agent and gatekeeper policies. And the way that this is done is by leveraging the fact that uh, Rego policies, so uh, Rego is the language used by OPA and gatekeeper, uh, Rego can be built into WebAssembly. And so why can't we then load this WebAssembly modules that have uh, OPA and gatekeeper policies inside of them and then execute them? So let's see how that could work. This is all in the early days, like I still working that last week, it, it came to life. So here we have policy that is, trust me, it's a copy and paste of, of this policy, all right? So it's a copy and paste of this policy from Gatekeeper library. This policy is uh, is looking into, into uh, pod creation and is basically rejecting uh, pods that have containers with, uh, with tags that are not, uh, not valid ones, all right? And the user can specify what are the tags that are not valid. So here we have some input for this policy. So the input of this policy, so we're going to run this policy against this input. And this input is uh, is how Gatekeeper expects that. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a pod creation of two pods of of a contain of of one pod with two containers and nginx one, which is using nginx with no tag specified, and is using MySQL with the latest tag specified. And here in the parameters of the policy, you can imagine that as the settings of of Kubernetes policies, we say that uh, latest and testing tags are are invalid; they are not accepted. So now we have this Rego policy. We have to compile that to WebAssembly. So you can use the OPA uh, CLI tool to do that. You download it from the OPA GitHub page. You do OPA build with uh, WebAssembly as target. Um, so here we have the, the source policy, okay? So you do OPA build 
you have to specify you have to specify the entry point of the policy the entry point is basically the the, the function that has to be called and the full path to it so these uh, regal policies defined inside of this package and the entry point is going to be violation all right so and then you add, we specify the path to the policy as a, as a result we have uh, what opa calls a bundle now we can extract from the bundle uh, a file which is uh, called policy.wasm all right and here we have a policy.wasm file and now we can run this uh, this policy without using opa without using gatekeeper you can imagine that running inside of uh, inside of cube i have this cli tool called burrego which is a joke around burrito and, and rico forgive me a bad taste um so it takes um does evaluation it takes as, a, as an input uh it takes the, the json data to evaluate and then the policy to be evaluated uh, it's me not remembering yeah so um once you run it, as you can see, it was pretty fast, and we get back exactly the result that will be produced uh, when evaluating the policy. So we, we know that the container MySQL backend is not allowed because it's using latest, and these policies are, these labels are not allowed, and the same applies, kind of the same applies to Nginx frontend because this one didn't specify any tags, so you have to specify a tag. So again, the policy is, uh, is working, um, in the same way, but we haven't run that into into all power gatekeeper, and I, we would like to have feedback from you about that uh, because we don't know if this is something that the community will be interested to have. You can imagine a cube warden has the universal policy engine that could run uh, policies written with uh, your favorite programming language, or could run also policies that were built with Rego, and yeah, that would be the idea. So, so Flavio, that was some amazing demo. So first of all, the uh, KWCTL is is cool because it lets you to uh, download the uh, policy from the uh, Qwarden Hub uh, and you know provide the input uh, .json and test the policy how it actually would work. That can be used in the CI systems, as you mentioned, which is a very critical part when you are uh, having the complete system so that the policy keeps on working for every change that is getting implemented. Uh, so I think that is very important. And also you can create the custom resource uh, using the same uh, KWCTL tool, and you can then add uh, your the path uh, the text file uh, that was there so you can add your own by setting some of the flags which is again very cool uh, and after that uh, i mean we have seen like how the policy is basically we have used the same policy which is hosted on uh, the cube warden hub and it gives you all the the pod security policy uh, which is deprecated so you can readily use that so that is actually one of the uh, you know, very good use case that you can start using right away. Uh, and you don't have to do anything because it's readily available. You can start using it and add your own, uh, customize it based on your on, on your needs. And um, then uh, then obviously you, you told very special thing about a Rego. Uh, so you can directly use OPA policies, convert them into Wasm and uh, use them uh, with CubeBot. And I think that is also something pretty neat because someone uh, might have written, you know, a lot of policies using Rego, but they wanted to write in other programming languages and do other things, but Cubewarden was not there. But now Cubewarden is there. They don't want to remove all the OPA policies. They still want to use it and they want to use the new tool. So I think that's that makes a very valid use case and very important one. Uh, you know, uh, you can easily use your OPA policies as well with Cube Warden and use the Cube Warden features as well. So I'm mean, really impressed with with the the capabilities. I think the the community would love uh, the features that Cube Warden is bringing into the game of Kubernetes policies. Uh, really excited for the for the acceleration how it uh, you know uh, moves in the cloud native ecosystem. But I mean, I really like the demo. To be very honest, thanks, thanks. Despite all the hiccups, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> that was a minor one, right? We know it had to work. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> okay, thanks. So uh, I will go back to the slides. I have just two slides and then I'm, I'm over. Sure. So um, what is on the roadmap? What is coming next? Uh, so we want to improve the observability. And here we are really looking for feedback from the community. This project is uh, is young and fresh, and if you if you if you join us, uh, you can really shape up how this is going to to be. So we are looking for user stories about uh, observability or any other thing that you have in mind. But observability is one of the next things we're going to work. We also want to improve uh, our Helm chart to make it easier to expose uh, some configuration knobs of uh, of policy server through the Helm chart. We want to uh, graduate the context of our policies to be production ready instead of alpha as we currently are. And then there is OPA support, which is something that I, I've just shared. Everything is open. Uh, we are not doing anything behind closed doors. So if you go to uh, this, uh, this link over there, you can see the, the board that we use to organize our work and you can uh, uh, interact with us over there. And speaking of interaction, so uh, this is how you can get in touch with us. So you can find us on uh, on Slack. We are inside of the Kubernetes workspace. We are also inside of the Rancher user workspace. We are on Twitter, we are on GitHub, and um, there are going to be links to all of that uh, down below into, into the YouTube description. And having said that, this is, this is all for me. Awesome. So while you were speaking, I was just Pasting, pasting all the links uh, in the live chat so that people can right away, uh, you know, uh, join all these follow cube warden for the latest updates and join on Slack to interact with the developers and uh, the maintainers uh, to provide feedback, uh, get working on some of the issues, uh, get the docs up and running, get uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, contributions because community contribution is key aspect, whether it's code based or it's uh, with the helm driven uh, helm for the helm um, uh, requirements and uh, even for the docs. Uh, even for the yep. blogs, uh, so you can you can actually write some of the cool guides uh, that that would be you know some of the cool use cases. Obviously, you will be yeah, since the programming domain is wide, not limited to certain aspects. So you can choose your 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 programming like Go, Rust, and you can use your programming languages and um, you know write those policies and uh, share them on the Cube Warden Hub as well. So I think those makes a very good. Um, uh, you know, um, yeah, there are awesome presentation, by the way, that I really want to show. So, Thanks. yeah, so I think, uh, Flavio, uh, that's pretty neat uh, demo. And I think Cube Warden has a great, great uh, future with the, with the roadmap, uh, with the kind of uh, way it is going uh, in future. Uh, and, uh, yeah, really impressed, impressed by some of the features, especially the OPA one that, that you just revealed is, is something... I mean, people will would readily, especially if they are using OPA and they want to use Cubeboard, and they can immediately start using it uh, with their previous policies intact. So I think that's pretty neat. So yeah, so we have the swag giveaway time now. Okay, so I'll so how we'll do do this is I'll just export <clears throat> I'll export the Google Forms uh, submissions that have been done in Excel, which I have done right now, and we have forty five responses. Uh, so we have forty five responses, and uh, you Flavio has to pick five random numbers, oh, okay. and, <laughs> and the name uh, corresponding to that number would be the winner. So as simple as that. So which one do you pick the first? Um, 27. 27. So it's Pratik Tripathi. So I'll just post in the comments as well the winners. And make sure the winners have to tweet out to Cube Warden. Uh, so what you actually learned from the stream and uh, you know uh, where you think you would be good uh, or you might contribute as well. So we'd love to hear that. So second number? 11. 11 it's kirtna posting in the chat third 35 35 is okay that's difficult to pronounce uh hero Chyoti datta i hope i pronounced that right Both. um free 
So three, I have to go above. Three is Arsh Sharma. Cool. And five? Uh, 42. <laughs> 42 okay the first and the last ones i mean the end ones also have something always so 42 Aryaman singh okay oh congratulations to all the winners uh and uh, you know a really amazing audience uh so you have been learning a lot uh i know this is something new very cool project you have seen but kubernetes policies are not new and there are some projects which are there in this space which shows that uh there is a need for kubernetes policies to be uh you know uh, thought in different ways and kubewarden has done that giving you the capabilities of writing in your own language extending that using even the opa policies uh using some capabilities uh, so i think that's that's pretty neat and yes congratulations to all the winners uh, i'll be giving your details to suse team uh, they will be again coordinating with you uh, for the swags and taking your postal address and all those things and a special thanks to flavio uh, for being on the stream and telling about this awesome project and definitely you'll see me around blogging and all those stuff and even contributing in the slack so I'll be uh, I'll be there, and I hope all the community members uh, to see uh, to join the Slack, interact, and use it, and, and just provide the feedback how it is, how easy it is to use, how the docs are, and all those things. So um, I really enjoyed the stream, uh, Flavio. So anything you want to thanks for to the community? I just want to say a big thank you to to you for organizing that, to all the people who joined, and uh, I'm looking forward to to have more interaction with the community. So don't be shy and reach out to us. Awesome. So thank you all. Uh, see you tomorrow. The super stream live series of uh, Ranch from Rancher and Suse on the awesome projects. Uh, projects every day we have something new in the store. Uh, so make sure you subscribe to the channel and uh, share it on Twitter so that more and more folks can learn about the awesome work that Rancher and Suse team has been working with the amazing open source projects. Uh, so okay. See you all tomorrow. Bye. Bye bye.